Garage Archive is the, currently the only publicly accessible archive of contemporary Russian art. So please tell me. There are so many arts archive accessible to, like the uh, National Center of Contemporary Art is open to everybody and has got also quite a good choice of material. But come on, let's go on. I mean, so that's good to know because I was aware that the NCCA archive was not publicly available, but that's great. So the NCCA archive is publicly available. Um, so this is, um, these two books are the first in a series that we are producing that um, basically start to put together some of the materials that we have um, in the archive. And currently the archive has around 120,000 documents. It starts from the 1950s and it runs through to the present day. And those documents include um, a whole load of different materials, including photographs, videos, um, information, ephemera from um, different galleries that have basically um, given us their collection of their materials as they were organising exhibitions. Um, there are archives from artists, there are archives from curators, there are archives from writers. So um, it's a very rich selection and of course for many of us we don't have the opportunity to go through the archive and find the materials for ourselves. So these books are kind of beginning to make publicly accessible um, some of the materials that otherwise we might not have the chance to see. And we started um, developing this series thinking about the 1990s as it's the moment when um, the contemporary art scene kind of becomes much more public, if you like. And it's the moment when the, there's a kind of real connection into the international art scene. So as you can see up here, there are two books. The first book that was published is called Exhibit Russia. And that's looking at the moment from Perestroika, so 86 to 96. And it's basically charting the um, 15 of the exhibitions that have either exhibited international artists in Russia for the first time or the first shows of Russian art internationally. And then Access Moscow is charting the decade 1990 to 2000 and it is basically looking at the figures who are on the scene in Moscow and giving first hand, account, hand accounts from their perspective. So. Um, with Exhibit Russia, oh. sorry, um, this just gives you an idea. This is the 15 exhibitions that were selected. Of course, there were many, many shows that we could have looked at, and um, in the back in the chronology, we do account for as many of the shows as we could possibly find. But the first exhibition starts in, um, starts in 1986 with a Sots Art exhibition at the New Museum. And um, the last one is Interpol that we selected as a kind of focus in 1996. And not all of them are what you might think as kind of traditional exhibitions. So for example, we covered the Sotheby's art auction in 1988 because this was a moment when, if you like, art was exhibited but not necessarily through an exhibition. It was a highly kind of controversial event that happened. Um, 
So the, the book basically doesn't take traditional exhibition making necessarily as the, the only way to you know, look at what, how Russian art was being exhibited and how international art was being exhibited here. So um, I'm just going to give you an example of three of the um, exhibitions that are covered, um, just to show you the kind of range. So um, Moscow, the Third Rome, was an exhibition that was curated by Victor Missiano. And um, this was presented in Italy. Um, so it was an exhibition that happened outside of um, Russia, but included, uh, it was controversial at the time because it included artists who didn't necessarily fit within the same underground circles. What Missiano was trying to do was to kind of give a cross-section of artists that were practicing in the country. And in the book, what you see is Victor writes an account from now as to how, the, he's, how he sees the exhibition from today. And then there are materials from the actual period as well as exhibition installation shots um, actually kind of brought together and presented within the biennial structure. So um, I then spoke over we interviewed her again and she told the story from her perspective today and there are many um, articles in the book that kind of chart what happened at the time from different perspectives of artists that were there. So each of the books also has um, a section called From the Archive where we have either translated from Russian into English or printed um, articles that happened around the world that basically kind of give the story of um, the decade from different perspectives. And then within each of the sections, there are also from the archive sections. And there is, sorry for this slide, it's very bad quality. Um, there is also a chronology in each of the books that charts the entire decade. Um, and what you see here is that in the kind of light grey, these are the um, events that are the social, political or cultural events in general that happen. And then there are um, dated aspects of like what was happening in um, Moscow or in the country at the time. So you start to get a feel for the number of exhibitions that happened, the number of events, the number of um, things that artists were getting up to at the time. So um, we're trying to kind of give an overview through the chronology. It's interesting, in 86, the first Goodwill Games opens on July 4th, uh, which is uh, um, the Goodwill Games were started by Ted Turner, and that's also the reason why David Ross was involved um, with Russia in the first place. Uh, just showing you here, 1990, between spring and summer, Soviet conceptual art in the era of late communism was the exhibition that David organized um, as a result of um, his in involvement in the Goodwill Games. So um, it kind of charts things that interconnect and things that show us how um, a community and a network are starting to build. That you've been able to buy here for a while called Reconstruction. It's a two volume book that basically looks at the 1990s um, through the eyes of the um, various galleries that started in the 1990s, like Regina Gallery or um, Elena Selena's um, X Gallery, XL Gallery. Um, so the Russian version, as I say, is two volumes and charts extensively the exhibitions that um, happened over that decade. And um, with the English language version, we've made it um, slightly smaller because it's the first time that material has been available in English uh, or kind of gathered together, if you like. And one of the important aspects of this book, this is, these are the chapters, so there are um, people who have been asked to write about the decade from different generations. So we have Diakonov as well as Kovalev who are writing about their perspectives on the decade. And then we have um, translated and reproduced the entirety of um, this publication that was made in 1993 called Who's Who in Contemporary Art, which was a journal that was expected to continue. The plan was that it would happen every couple of years, but there's actually only one version of it that ever came out. But there were 25 people that were integral to the um, art scene in Moscow who all write their first-hand perspectives of what they think the art world is in 1993. So these have been translated so that people can um, find out, not from, kind of, from a number of different voices, so that we don't have one way of being able to tell the story. 
And then again, there's the From the Archive section, um, which translate. There's a lot of um, materials from the Moscow Art Magazine that have been translated, that, um, and from a no number of different. Can show you here. So, um, Georgi Lichachevsky, so an artist is writing, as, as you probably know, he's a prolific, a motley crew of people with him. It's very interesting. He, he brought the artist Rosemary Truckle, and he also brought um, two collectors called Don and Mira Rubel, who now are giant collectors in Miami, and they have their own museums. And I wonder if they even know that this film exists, because it's fascinating <laughs> seeing these two Americans being taken to um, artist studios. So in um, this film is uh, produced by, um, uh, he's a TV <coughs> producer and a, a video artist called Skip Blumberg. And uh, so he came along on this trip as well and basically makes this 30 minute video um, following David and his, his crew um, into um, Kabakov studio at the time. Indeed, it's in, in But I was studying Russian literature. Uh, at Columbia University, and, um, or I started two years later. And uh, long story, fast forward, I was working in, I started working for Art Farm magazine in 1979, and uh, later in about 83 for uh, Art in America and writing about art. And because I spoke Russian, um, it was kind of natural that I would be interested in going to write about this. And, and I, I got to know a lot of the emigrant artists uh, who had come to uh, New York who emigrated in the 70s. Um, Komar Melamid, uh, Leonid Sokov, um, Sasha Kasalak, of tons of people. And um, it, it was in Vagrich Bakhchenyan, who was a very important, wonderful, wonderful artist. And um, it was sort of like you got to know, you met one person, and then all of a sudden you knew everybody in this huge, not so huge, but a large group of people. And um, then I think it was because of them I decided that, you know, everyone was writing about unofficial art, non conformist usually dissident artists. And dissident was really not the correct word to use. And a lot of the artists got really sick and tired of being called dissident artists. So I sort of set out to try and explain what that was. And that started with the 1985 articles, which were on official art. David? Well, first, it's always made a lot of sense to me that Jamie uh, understood this, because the, the connection between the literary world and and, uh, and unofficial writers and unofficial filmmakers and unofficial artists was was very it was, a, it was one world, and but there's always been a kind of a literary aspect to uh, I think to the, that early work as well. I mean, conceptual art in a sense is kind of involved with literary. Uh, but if you give me the clicker and you put that um, little PowerPoint thing on, I can tell you about the kind of accidental way I became involved here. Is it? Is it? Just give me a minute. But I wasn't going to complain because, you know, I wasn't doing the digging. <clears throat> and you can see they had brought with them a blank canvas, stretched canvas. It fit perfectly. They got into the grave, and then they lay down with the canvas over their heads. And, uh, and then Aliona uh, reburied them. Again, I said I was not interested in doing manual labor, but I, I did help at the end when we replaced the sod so that there was a perfect, there's Ayona, and then we placed the sod and then and my, my orders were to, they took my little mic, the lavalier microphone, they had, it, it was on a wire, there were no wireless mics yet, and they had that with them under the canvas, the three of them were under the canvas, we placed the, and, uh, the sod back over and then I was told then to start the video camera and so the video camera basically just shot that, that's all you saw and you heard them uh, underneath the ground speaking and Aljona spoke into the microphone and the translation the one line I remember was where is Chris Burton when we need him <laughs> I remember that <clears throat> there was more and we could hear them struggling we could hear them having a hard time breathing because there wasn't a lot of air underneath there <clears throat> and eventually 
they pushed themselves up through the ground and they came out having made a painting with dirt, charcoal, and spit <laughs> called Underground, Underground, art. Underground Art. And uh, there they are. This is a wonderful picture. They were, they were really exhausted and not very happy. And so, uh, and I think that may be the last image. Uh, there it is, there's the last image. And so, uh, uh, to make a very long story short, uh, I took this video back, I took this video and we went back to their apartment. We celebrated the making of the first video piece, in the video performance piece in Soviet art history. Uh, and then I got very nervous that uh, somehow I wasn't going to be able to bring this actually home and I would get stopped somehow, like, you know, my paranoia of being an American here. But my paranoia was also enhanced by the fact that next door to, to them lived an old man in the same apartment building. My name is Antonio Chelsea, we, we met already before, and I wrote thank to you about this incident in my history of Russian video art. But uh, this is actually interesting because the third version of one story, because when I interviewed both Rochelle and Kristova, they told me that actually they knew that the tape was confiscated at uh, customs. No, it wasn't. Yeah, no, that's the, what they told me. Oh, I There's see. always I see. different truths. Yeah. And when we were in correspondence with you, you mentioned the boxes, but you didn't say that uh, they were missing. You still ho were hoping that somehow those tapes will come up. So now it's actually... Well, I'm very hopeful that sometime in the KGB archives, Someone will say. But hey, actually, they actually you did you brought them with you. Yes, they it? made it all the way to Berkeley. They made it to New York. They made it then back to Berkeley in the vault. I, but you I, don't have any picture of you filming or recording. There's no it? pictures of that because you know. Okay, so we're going to get back to the 1990s now. Thanks. Yes, <laughs> but anyway, I, I'll just quickly say that ten years later. Be this man who was the cultural cultural attaché who was at the time also editor of Soviet Life, which was the version of what the, the, the American version of Zamedico, this um, magazine that the embassy would hand out. And uh, he, he asked if I was still interested in doing this. I said, yes, absolutely. And um, he goes, can you go in two weeks? I said, no, no, no. So first of all, we here, uh, the magazine will have to buy the ticket a month in advance, or else it will be too expensive. So anyway, I ended up going in February 1985. So that was 1984. I ended up going in February 1985, shortly before Chen Yinka died, and uh, interviewing people in the artists' union. I got to meet Dmitry Nobandian, who, as he told me proudly, had specialized in painting uh, Soviet leaders. As he had painted uh, Lenin. He hadn't painted Lenin in person because he wasn't. He was too young then, but he did, from photographs, you know, and uh, Stalin and the whole Politburo and so on. And then he had, it was published in Art in America, he had a painting out of Lenin looking at the Sistine Madonna. Uh, three or four years ago, all these so-called artists 
organize the big show in the forest for this place. And for us it's a very important place. Uh, it's, it's like a symbol of uh, independence of unofficial art. A symbol of all our life uh, before uh, destroying it. Нам не сказать ничего, перец на столько километров. Отличие от того, что мы так платим. Ну, ошибка, что мы делаем, а ничего не соображают. Чейн Би-2. Не знал, кто знал. Это Савет. famous dissidents of Tsarist times who were hanged. But here they are tagged Cezanne, Gauguin, Van Gogh, Matisse, Picasso. And somewhere here, there he is. Our artist, Yuri Albert, writes that he too could have been hanged. In contrast to the West, where postmodernism is built on complete erudition, knowledge, and a conscious mixing of different styles, here in Russia it's built on total illiteracy and ignorance. We just jumble together bits and pieces of information, like barbarians. I'm not talking about any specific art or artist, just the situation as a whole, which affects all of us. What you missed at the beginning was when it was explaining where the, the exhibition happened in parallel with the Sotheby's auction. So it was the first time that um, there was an exhibition of unofficial art that was official. Was that Kuznetsky Most? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. In English, it's much easier to. I didn't translate the title. I was just one of the people who discussed what the translation might be. Sorry to turn my back to you. Um, but we, it's very difficult to come up with a succinct title in. In Russian, when you have a succinct it can be, when you have a succinct title in English. So we had lots of options and we looked at direct translation, which we didn't like. One of the other problems we had was with the term the new international, because in uh, Russian the term international has a different meaning for Russian speakers. So we tried to find a title which would balance the subtitle with the term Nov International and the actual title of the book, and that's how we came to that conclusion. But the idea about exhibiting Russia in English was supposed to say something, exhibit Russia, was supposed to say something about opening, it was supposed to say something about barriers uh, coming down. And we thought that the best uh, version, the best version we could come up with with our translations was to look at the idea of opening. So that's where it came from. Thank you.